Presbyterian. I'm here to tell you that yesterday, your elders, our session, voted unanimously to take advantage of the opportunity to share in the Lord's Supper virtually in this time where we're not able to gather together. Typically in the Presbyterian church, our two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, are only to be celebrated within a physical gathering of community. This is where I'm thankful that our church is reformed and always reforming. We constantly look at ourselves and the world around us so that we don't adapt to it, but we work within it to allow the spirit to change and move and reach beyond us. So in services in the future, specifically Maundy Thursday and Easter, we'll be gathering together virtually to celebrate a virtual Lord's Supper. It is no different. It'll feel different. But as we gather, I have a few things I just want to share with you. The first and foremost is that you don't want to get stuck on running out to the store to buy just the right grape juice or just the right bread. I don't want your health to be at risk. So I went downstairs to the church's kitchen to see what I could find. Surprisingly, I found no grape juice. I found prune juice. I found the very basic element of water. And I even found a bottle of La Croix. Do I think and believe and feel that since that is not grape juice or wine, that Christ is not present? Absolutely not. In this time and in this age, I know that God moves beyond our earthly means in order to show us his grace. I did not find a one loaf of bread. I did not find unleavened bread. I found simple white bread in a plastic bag. Do I believe that God can still work through this to offer to me the grace that I so desperately need? Without a doubt. I'm thankful that our denomination has given us these guidelines. I want to share a few words with you. The Sacrament of the Lord's Supper offers an abundant feast of theological meaning, including thanksgiving to God the Father, remembrance of Jesus Christ, invocation of the Holy Spirit, communion in the body of Christ, and a meal of the realm of God. The Lord's Supper also reflects our calling to feed others as we have been fed and offers a foretaste of that heavenly banquet when God will wipe away every tear and swallow up death forever. So as you celebrate this different communion with your families, I want you not to picture just this table. I want you to picture the ends of this table wrapping around the entire world so that all of God's children gather together, whether we are virtually together or physically together. We sit at that one table and remember the good and great gift of Jesus Christ. We gather as the great cloud of witnesses so that we might not only remember, but we might be fed with the spiritual food that comes from God alone. I will stand here and say the words of institution. And in your homes, when I say you may, I invite you to share with your family and your friends, whoever is there, the bread and the cup. I'm always here if you have any questions. I would be honored to speak with any of you if you have questions about how this is different for us in this day and age. In the meantime, peace and blessings.
Bethel Presbyterian Church on this Holy Thursday. Here in the Presbyterian Church, we call it Maundy Thursday. And today, we're celebrating a service of shadows. Throughout the service, you'll hear the readings of the Passion Story. I want to thank our readers for um, recording and sending those in. During that time, you'll also see the candles um, go out one by one. That symbolizes the light of Christ going out of the world as we get closer to the time of his death. It is a somber service. It moves slowly. It is meant to be meditated. We will celebrate communion in just a few moments. I invite you to gather your elements at home. At the end of the service, you will see the screen go black and you'll hear 33 tolls of the bell. Each toll is to remind us of one year of Jesus's life. Let us now worship God. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house. The teacher says, Where is my guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went into the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared for the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God.
On this night of all holy nights, we remember the Lord's Supper. But it's also important to remember that before we come to this meal, which is very somber, as well as celebratory, the disciples gathered around that larger table to celebrate the Passover. And so there, as they were celebrating the Passover together, they were remembering and rejoicing in the exodus from Egypt, that their Lord had delivered them. What happened in the years after that exodus event was that each year uh, they would sacrifice a lamb. And of course, if you remember your exodus story, they would take the lamb's blood and put it over their door, door, doors, and then the Lord would pass over, hence Passover. And so that, that very night, they're celebrating Passover, and as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want you to get into that celebratory mood, because that's where the disciples would have been. They were happy. It was a joyous occasion. And, and when you go to a Seder, kids are running around, and there's candy, and there's stories, and there's all of this wonderful excitement, and I can't get that feeling, but try and grasp that. So after they celebrated that Seder meal and remembered their good and gracious God, we remember the next thing that John tells us in his gospel is Jesus knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. And when he did that, we all know that's an act of humility and servitude. We all know what Peter said when he said, no, Lord, you will not wash me. And Jesus said, if I can't wash you, you have no part in me. And Peter said, not just my feet, then all of me. And so we remember our baptism. But as Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he also ended that passage by saying, go and do likewise. And I'm always reminded on Monday, Thursday, that I don't like my feet washed by other people. Probably you don't either. It's kind of a, it's a difficult experience because we're self-conscious. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that probably wasn't what the disciples were thinking. They just thought it's not right that their Savior should wash their feet. But what that does is when their feet were washed, they became a part of Christ. By telling us to go and do likewise, to go and wash another's feet, we're told to act with humility and servitude. And I remember that, that just that very kneeling of Jesus, that's hard. All that kneeling and, and washing, it, it, it takes a toll on you. And serving does as well. It's hard and it's, it's, it can drain you. And so I love that scripture then joins us here at this table. For just as we are told to go and serve our neighbors and friends, go, do likewise, it is our Savior that meets us at the table and gives us the perfect illustration of what to do. So my friends, in the Presbyterian Church, it is Jesus Christ who is host and Lord at this table. I say it is not my table, it is not the table of the Front Royal Presbyterian Church, it is not the table of the Presbyterian Church USA, it is Christ alone who invites us to this table, and tonight that is no different. Though we are not gathered in body, we are gathered in spirit. We are gathered as if this table was wrapped around the entire world, and all of God's people gather at it together, virtually in spirit, in body, but most of all in love. So in that thought, in those memories, let us remember today that this is the Lord's table. So may the Lord be with you. And also God, with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Lord, we try to remember that you have been from the beginning of time that you remind us that you are the Alpha and you are the Omega, that you are the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and we are somewhere in between, just a speck in time. And yet still, Lord, you, in your gracious mercy, reached down from heaven. And in that great act of love, you took on flesh and blood and lived among us. 
You took on our pains and our burdens. You wept and you were hungry. You were thirsty and, and you walked a long journey to the cross, Lord. And we need to remember. In this day, in this age, we have so much to be thankful for. Not just for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, that as we remember his life and his death and in good time, his resurrection. We also remember that though we may seem alone in this world today, we are not. Because you have said, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, Lord, with great thanksgiving, this time together we celebrate in a different way. But we know, Lord, that you can move beyond all of those earthly things around us because your spirit is greater and it is more magnificent and more awesome and amazing than we can even begin to fathom. So, Lord, as we gather in our own homes, much like the disciples did with you many years ago, may your spirit move in that place. May your spirit be present in the breaking of bread, in the drinking of a cup. May your spirit be present in those moments of silence when we don't have words to say. May your spirit be present when little children ask for more. May your spirit be present when we laugh and we giggle together around that table over a meal. May your spirit be present now and always just as you promised us it would always be. So Lord, through your good, through your goodness, through your gracious mercy, we pray that powerful prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, just as you are serving others, you are also served by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are fed at this table, and on tonight of all nights, we remember that after the Passover was celebrated, it was Christ who sat at the table with his disciples, and after having blessed the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you, take and eat. And in like manner, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. My friends, this is the feast of the people of God. Rejoice, celebrate, remember. The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, we don't understand this act of, of servitude. We can't comprehend how you would send your own son to live among us and to die among us. We can't understand how he would give his own body and blood, but we give thanks. And we stay in that place of faith that tells us that when we don't understand, faith takes us the rest of the way, and thanks be to God. Amen and amen.
And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh, and fitteth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter the t into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, and speak to the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, neither with, the, with, with they want what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and said unto them, Sleep on now. And take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayed me is at hand. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you were one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consolation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accu accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurgent. The crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do the same for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? for he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, What do you wish me to do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. 
Pilate asked them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross 
that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who had stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. <laughs> 